Dennis, I thank you so much. What a generous uh, introduction and what a warm and friendly crowd. Uh, I could really just repeat what uh, Dennis has said and sit down, and I think I would be uh, complete. Uh, a great statement of, of your belief. He and I have talked literally hundreds of hours together over the years, and I've always had such great respect for him. And thank you so much. Uh, John Stocks, it's great to be with you. John Wilson, my longtime friend. Uh, Harriet Sanford, and head of this uh, foundation. Uh, thank all of you for uh, this uh, warm welcome, and it's a real honor for me to be back in Washington speaking with you. Some of you might know <coughs> I celebrated my <coughs> 80th birthday this year, and I had uh, <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> the thing about that is you have dozens of parties. So first thing, I want to urge all of you to take good care of yourself. If you can make it to 80, uh, you have these wonderful parties. And I mean, it really is nice. You really haven't done anything. You've just reached 80. <laughs> I remember the uh, story I heard some time ago at the senior citizens meeting and said that it was an expert, a couple of your experts here uh, for this meeting, and he was talking about aging, and he had a blackboard, and he said, did you realize that for every 80-year-old man, one man, there are three 80-year-old women? And some guy in the back stood up, an old man, he said, uh, Mr. Expert, that is the most useless information I've ever heard. <laughs> <coughs> so I, <coughs> I would urge all of you to try to make 80. Uh, and, but please keep doing the good work that you're doing. I always feel at home with a fine group of uh, educators and education supporters. Uh, that's what we have here today, people who are committed uh, and believe in a uh, public education system that we have. But nowadays it seems a lot of people, uh, Dennis referred to, uh, question the quality, the value of public education. Uh, some criticism might be valid, but I strongly believe there are many that are not accurate uh, and many statements that are really unfair and are not productive. For instance, I was very uh, disappointed that the media hardly mentioned four uh, very important findings in the 2013 Gallup poll on public education just recently released. First, the poll found that a majority of Americans, more than 50%, give their community public schools an A or B grade. That's the highest rating ever recorded uh, by this poll, their own schools where their children go. However, as you and I know over the years this has been true, fewer than 20% of the people, less than one in five, give our public schools nationally a B or better. And that is the lowest rating of confidence in our public schools nationally. I suppose, again, we shouldn't be surprised at that with the flood of negative media that is out there about our public schools constantly. A second important finding, in my view, is that our public places value on the teaching of 21st century skills such as critical thinking, communications, collaboration, and creativity. Uh, Harriet mentioned collaboration. I like that word, Harriet, and I know you do, and I'll use it several times here. Third, more than 70% of respondents indicated that they have trust and confidence in their own uh, public school teachers and principals, 70%. And fourth, 70% of Americans oppose private school vouchers, the highest level of opposition to vouchers ever recorded in this annual survey that's been going on quite a while. <clears throat> These uh, results confirm what I hear and what I see as I travel around this great country as I talk to parents and as I talk to other stakeholders and those who are into education. 
And the fact is that our country is blessed with a lot of dedicated teachers, school administrators, staff, families, communities who want only the best for their children. They, like all of you, are working hard to achieve that goal. Anybody who knows me knows one thing that I'm very interested in, and that is uh, the word partnership. I think that's a critical word. Anything that works well together uh, works well generally. People who work together, parents and other caregivers, teachers, other school personnel, uh, really business, faith and community leaders, youth serving groups, after school providers, and so forth, all working together can accomplish much, much more. I also believe in government, uh, which can and should be a partner uh, when it comes to improving education for our children. Now, regardless of any political or ideological uh, fact that one might have or, or difference, all of us should share a common goal, and that is to provide every one of our children uh, a quality, engaging education that Dennis uh, so eloquently spoke of, coming out of high school, prepared for college, prepared for careers, prepared for citizenship. We must give our students the skills and the knowledge, the opportunity to participate in the social and economic mainstream of our great democracy. From their first days in school to the last day, our children need our individual and collective help to succeed and prepare them for adulthood. Now, the success of the NEA Foundation initiatives, the Closing the Achievement Gaps initiative, the Institute for Innovation in Teaching and Learning, clearly illustrate the value uh, and the impact of partnerships. Despite high poverty rates and other challenges at your sites, collaboration among your association, school district, and community leaders is resulting in greater student achievement, and that's what we're all about. So with input from all stakeholders in developing your priorities and a strategic plan for attaining them, followed by goal-setting, action, and regular monitoring, you have a strong foundation for improvement as well as sustainability, and boy, is that important. The Lee County, Florida site is an example of that successful formula, and I know from personal experience that any education reform is difficult, but sustaining, sustaining a reform uh, over any period of time is really difficult. So I thank each of the leadership teams for your dedicated effort, as well as the NEA Foundation for the support of your site initiatives to improve teaching and learning. As a nation, though, uh, we are in a critical moment of transition in education reform. Dennis alluded to that. You all know that. For the first time, there seems to be this consensus that he talked about, this finishing high school, uh, the idea that you're ready for college, that you're ready for life, that you're ready for careers, that you're ready to be good citizens of this country. That's clear, and those are wonderful goals. Uh, to most of us assembled here, that really is, is kind of a no-brainer. We all understand all of that. But we know, too, that it has not always been the guiding force in far too many decisions that are made <clears throat> regarding education policies and practices. As I indicated a moment ago, the Gallup poll and other research tell us there is significant agreement among parents about what they want for their child's education. Well, that's out there, and that's positive. Interestingly, businesses have been clamoring for those same skills from our students for quite some time. Together with teamwork and problem solving, they are what we refer to as deeper learning, as well as 21st century skills. So now that we have a consensus uh, on 
on the core goals, Dennis, as you pointed out, our attention is being directed as to how we achieve those goals. Clearly, important and significant shifts in teaching and learning are necessary. What we are going is different. All students must master more rigorous content knowledge than ever before. And that will be facilitated by implementation of the Common Core standards, state standards, as we all know, uh, beginning next year. Now, I've always supported high academic standards for our children in core subjects for every single child. If expectations are low, performance will be low. In one of your groups looking at gaps that we talk about, often those gaps are a result of low expectation for early age forward. But we have a very careful uh, high standards, uh, we have to be careful that high standards uh, do not turn into standardization uh, that takes the create creativity and the, and the craft uh, out of teaching. Common Core deals only with math and English language arts. And we, those are very basic, obviously, and very important. We've got to realize, though, if you're talking about prepared for college or prepared for careers, uh, most colleges, a lot of the colleges, of course, require three or four years of foreign language in high school, uh, music, other arts, which I strongly support and believe in, three or four years of hands-on science, uh, all of that required by college when you finish high school, so really, Common Core doesn't measure all of those things. Uh, however, Common Core is basic and very important, but all of us need to be aware of this number of issues that young people must deal with. So that requires certain enrichment opportunities in addition to those basics. Uh, to learn and experience uh, after school is an opportunity for that, weekends, summers, in addition, all students must be able to apply, and that's a key word, the content knowledge that they've gained. Uh, that's where those 21st century skills come in. Research indicates that employers value both knowledge and skills, and everyone I'm going to tell you that. Skills are important. Somebody can be the smartest person around, but if they don't have these basic skills, uh, they, uh, there's very little that they can accomplish uh, in this world. They particularly seek candidates who can apply knowledge successfully. They want employees who can conduct research and use evidence-based analysis to solve real-world problems. In addition, nearly all employers rate the ability to innovate, talking about art and music, talking about all those things that develop innovative characteristics. They are also a key to success in the workplace and in the world. Now, I personally am a big fan of project-based learning because I've seen firsthand how effective that is in learning content and then applying it. Uh, the Knowledge Works Foundation, which I've on that board, I've been on that board for 10 years or so, is heavily involved uh, with new tech network uh, schools. Uh, I visited a number of those new tech high schools. Some middle schools have been so impressed and excited uh, in the engagement of the students. Uh, they are working in teams, they're communicating, they're learning content, they're solving problems, all the skills they will need to be successful as adults. I was in one of these uh, New Tech high schools in, in Sacramento, a uh, public school, big school, uh, and, and to show you, and I know you all are very familiar with project-based learning, but I was so impressed to go in there, not like the normal classroom, of course, students in groups of five or six, uh, working on projects with the teachers moving around as uh, uh, people who are then helping coach them. Uh, this one that I was looking at particularly was studying geometry, the, the core uh, standard, require state standard for geometry. Uh, and they were doing it by 
uh, laying out a golf course. And they went out to the golf course, and they looked at all the different angles and whatever. And those of you who are golfers know that you can angle off every now and then. But the, uh, these young people were into that. I mean, it was their work. One was writing it up. One was going to speak about it. Uh, they had a leader. Uh, they had all the different groups working together, solving this problem, learning about geometry. Uh, I'll tell you, I was impressed with it. And I'll tell you this, they don't drop out of school. The dropouts are just about zero. Why? Because the young people like it. And they won't drop out, at, generally, uh, at all. Uh, and also, when they finish this course, in high school, they have uh, uh, like 12 hours, at least, of college credit. So they're already moving into the college world. Anyhow, I like that. I think that's kind of the way of the future. There are a number of similar programs like that that work very well, but that's one that I'm familiar with. But through the Knowledge Works partnership uh, with the Riley Institute at Furman University, uh, several uh, businesses, together we were successful in gaining an I-3 grant to bring in these new tech uh, high schools to South Carolina two high schools in the very poorest part of our state. We refer to it as the corridor of shame of the I-95 corridor. Uh, practically all poor, practically all African-American, just about all rural. Uh, most difficult area that you can imagine to, to work out a high quality school. So we have two of those schools right there. One is Scotch Branch. Uh, high school where Brown versus Board got started. Uh, and I'm so proud of that and I'm very interested in those being a success. Uh, the entire state is excited about the opportunity this new way of learning will bring to our neediest students. Uh, and we are working to bring more new tech schools to South Carolina in the future. We've got three or four really in process. Achieving the, this higher bar, a bar of learning is absolutely essential uh, to the future of our states and our nation. It is the engine for our economic prosperity, our global competitiveness, our great democracy. But to accomplish this, though, evidence and experience tells us that changes in education practice and teaching and learning are every bit as important as changes in policy. While we've seen a lot of changes in education policy, a lot of talk about it uh, over the last decades, policy, policy, policy. Much less changed in schools in the classroom. As a result, we have seen only modest improvement uh, in this new requirements that are out there in student performance. And I think we need to do better uh, in these changing times to get our schools really in touch with the times. And I think we're moving there. And that's what these two sites are about. Uh, that's what you all are about. But now we have a chance to change uh, all of this uh, changing needs out there. For the first time, we do have this emerging consensus that we need to move to teaching models that are more personalized around each student. Project-based learning, I just mentioned, is one example of that. You know many others. But this personalizing education works. Uh, it's, it's expensive in many ways, but it works. Technology can be a big help with that. We must value mastery instead of seat time. Plan our use of time more wisely. Deeper learning can be promoted through expanded learning time, after school, academic enrichment opportunities, and so forth. These can be provided before and after school, as I mentioned, in weekends and summers. Uh, we must utilize technology better, including apps, ebooks, teacher development uh, materials, and so forth. New technology is presenting a powerful tool for bring, bringing better uh, training, better teaching, better learning to scale. Uh, it's creating pressure for change from our first generation of digital learners. They are ready for that, and you and I know it. 
There are many drivers uh, of this uh, moment of opportunity, and I really think it's a very important moment of opportunity. The Common Core standards in addressing the learning interests and needs of the whole child can be a bridge to the shift from a focus on policy to a focus on practice. This will require us to move beyond accountability, to focus on capacity, to focus on equity, to focus on implementation. We need to empower the profession of teachers and promote innovation, evaluation, and continuous improvement. And we need to deal more directly and effectively with the effects of poverty. Poverty is out there. And you and I, as much as we talk about <coughs> grades and tests or whatever, poverty is, is an overburdening problem that we all deal with uh, in terms of academic achievement. And every one of you all know that. Often the obstacles to student success are too, com too complex uh, to overcome uh, by one person coming out of a family that's having difficulty and mixed all up. Uh, even a wonderful, wonderful, brilliant teacher, uh, it's almost impossible to turn that child around uh, certainly quickly. But if the lessons being taught in school are competing with a child's hunger, competing with a child's homelessness, anger, illness, safety, other health and welfare problems, that student simply cannot learn well, uh, if at all. A recent study of the Southern Education Foundation reported <clears throat> that in 2011, uh, for the first time in the last four decades, a majority of our public school students in the South, as you well know, that's where I'm from. Uh, sometimes I'm proud of that, sometimes I'm not. Anyhow, in the South uh, and in the West uh, are eligible for federal free and reduced price uh, meals at school, a majority in the South and the West. A decade earlier, only four states reported a majority of low-income students. By 2011, 48%, nearly half of our nation's 50 million public school students fell into that category. Now, that's, that's what we're, we're dealing with in this wonderful, powerful uh, economic country. Uh, there can be no question that we must provide the supports necessary to relieve negative environmental factors if we want a child to succeed in school. We've got to deal with all of these things. It's vitally important for us to focus on ways to address children's readiness to learn, including even before they enter school. And that's something I'm extremely interested in right now. Again, looking at gaps. The teacher home visits in Seattle and Columbus are a step in that direction. But above all, research, evidence, and experience tell us that the single most important factor in achieving these shifts in teaching and learning is the quality and effectiveness of our nation's teachers and school leaders. Both are very important. Supporting educator capacity and empowering the profession of teaching individually and collectively must be at the core of our education agenda during this transition. A lot is happening. Teachers and, teach and leaders in education are in the middle of that. We must make sure that the system of educator evaluation are high quality and multifaceted uh, just as Elgin, Illinois, and Jefferson County, Colorado are doing uh, with their NEA Foundation Innovation Grant. Teacher evaluation must be accompanied by effective professional development and multiple measures. That has to be done and done right and done fairly. We must continuously improve the quality of our teacher preparation programs and find ways to bring more of our best and brightest people into the teaching profession. And we've heard a lot about Finland, uh, a model of education system because of their high test ranking. But we should look more closely at how they treat teachers. In Finland, young people are clamoring to become teachers because the profession is among the, uh, the highest respected, competitive, and well-paid in the country. 
All of those are factors. Well paid is important. Respected is important. Teaching in America must become a team enterprise supported by real resources. And I'll tell you, continuous learning, creative problem solving, both during school day and after school, must engage classroom teachers and community organizers all working together. Professional teams in all major professions, engineering, healthcare, law, whatever, embrace well-defined performance goals. We now have goals, well-orchestrated team members who join forces to improve their performance with real-time assessment, feedback, and supportive leadership. Our teachers must have the same resources and support as these other professions do. Uh, America's teachers are the solution. They are not the problem. But they will be successful only, only if they are given sufficient time and resources to implement the common core and next generation science standards effectively. Political and education leaders uh, should not rush to turn the common core standards into new high stakes accountability requirements. Instead, uh, we must support school leaders and teachers who are modeling new teaching methods and providing collaborative work environment. Teachers need designated time. They need physical settings where they can meet with their colleagues to find the most effective ways to meet the learning needs of their students. With the new Common Core standards, we can begin to envision what it will take to rebuild American education. That's a start. We should keep in mind, though, that they are not a finished product, these standards. They are a work in progress. They rest on an evidence-based theory of teaching that calls for continuous feedback uh, to extend, refine, revise the standards uh, as their value is tested. Now, the standards are templates that will enable constructive dialogue among education stakeholders and others about our children, what they should know and be able to do. If we truly want them to thrive in a complex global community with a rapidly evolving innovation economy, we have made progress, but we have plenty of hard work in front of us. As always, educators and partnerships that we form together uh, will be the critical component of our success. We are betting the future of our children and our country on our teachers. So we have an obligation to stand with them, to support them, and they strive to give every child the opportunity to succeed academically and become contributing members of our great democracy. The very positive findings about local schools in this recent Gallup poll should be another motivating force to tell us work harder and smarter. But I believe these findings tell us something else. All of us must find new and better ways to lift up the voices of local parents, local teachers, and other local community meter members into this national dialogue about what is really happening in the public schools. That's our job. The foundation, others need to find more ways to engage more local people in our public schools so that we are a lar larger positive force for doing what is right and good for our public school students. As many of you have heard me say for decades, Better education is everybody's business, and we do it better when we do it together. And that is what NEA Foundation initiatives and all of you site representatives are all about. And I know it's not always easy work, and there are always burdens to overcome. I salute your passion, your dedication, your tenacity. At the same time, I would like to see that same passion 
and commitment ingrained more deeply in the public at large. With all of our divisions and misinformation about education and so many other issues, I believe the American people need a clear uh, mission uh, for moving education forward. And I've been thinking about this to accomplish that. Uh, I think we might consider a movement in America that clearly prioritizes one thing, children. We need to come together on something we can all agree on. And I haven't thought that out completely, but we need some kind of unifying force and to have this country say that is our priority in the future, I think is something to think about. When I was governor of South Carolina, we did that you know, with the Education Improvement Act that Dennis referred to. And I'll tell you, it made a difference. The EIA was more than just a position paper or a piece of legislation. It was a citizen's movement calling for high academic standards and quality education for all. I was and am very uh, proud of that. Uh, the fact that uh, I was a leader then, a governor, uh, of a very positive citizens movement, uh, all supported strongly by teachers, all educators, supported by parents, uh, supported by the business community, uh, all parties, all ideologies. I had trouble getting the legislature. Everybody else in the state was for it. So let's, you understand that. <clears throat> so let's every one of us think about that in our homes, in our workplaces, our schools, our places of worship, our communities. How can we, in a thoughtful way, make America's very first priority be our children, their education, their health, their shelter, their character, their morals, their safety, all of it the whole child. One America, one America for all children. That's something I think everyone understands and could get behind, a patriotic movement with kind of a laser-like focus on making America's children the number one national priority. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, all of you already have the interests of children at the forefront of what you're doing. So let's think about how we might partner, come together across all social, political, economic segments of our society that make this American movement or something like it a reality. And thank you all very much for giving me the opportunity to be with you. Thank you.